Poor theory, I call meeting to order. Um, but to welcome our guests. Mr. White, trust the White. Is there anybody on the Zoom? Um, Jess uh, Falkowski and Valerie Parker. Do you have any comment? Anybody on the Zoom has a comment? No? Go for it, please. Uh, Shane Zagami. Here. Nate Feeney is absent. Uh, Thomas Hubbard. Here. Louis Serrano is absent. And Ryan Michael. Here. All right. Item four approval of 11022 Public Court Utility Committee minutes. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. Discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Both, I have it. Item five, acknowledgement of water sewer permit. I'll make a motion to acknowledge the water sewer permits and applications. A second. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. I have it. Thank you. Education presentation and reports. After an improvement plan presentation and discussion. Right. Yep. I guess for the later half, I think starting in August, September of 2021, um, kind of had some of the project plan in there. And as uh, various things happened, changed, you know, we brought it back, said, hey, we're shifting this project there. I guess uh, I think we got in a spot now where we can hopefully get an endorsement of the projects and start going on sending out RFPs for some of the design projects in uh, 2023. So that uh, we can get those um, ready for bid, hopefully by uh, next year at this time. And then I'm you know, kind of looking at where we're at for the 24, 25, 26 uh, year projects. Um, and so I just wanted to steal a couple slides from uh, some previous meetings that we've had. Uh, you know, our, um, our, our capital assets, you know, we try to talk about those if we kind of just just kind of ignore the parks at this moment. Um, you know, we got 118 center line miles of road, about 110 miles of water main, about 102 miles of sewer, uh, about 62 miles of storm sewer, and over 50 pieces of equipment that we use, whether it's for snow plowing, uh, street maintenance, um, you know, excavations, mowing. Um, so that's, that's what makes up all of the items that we need here at the village as far as our infrastructure and maintaining our infrastructure uh, is concerned. You know, so the benefits of those assets is, you know, the public health, you know, the clean drinking water, that's been a big topic in the last week or so. Um, sanitation, uh, the movement of goods and people, whether that's plowing to keep the roads in good condition or, you know, patching, paving the roads to keep them in good condition. Um, flood protection, um, you know, the fire protection that comes into play with the water utility, um, our environmental, you know, the mitigation of storm water and as well as drinking water. Um, and then some, some of it is just, it's a, it's a natural monopoly. There's not a, another company out there that's, you know, supplying, you know, water service, sewer service, transportation out there, you know, they're capital intensive projects. So, um, you know, so we talk about the capital improvement plan, um, you know, so we try to focus on a five-year plan where we identify our projects and our equipment. Or we try to create a schedule, um, some of the financing options, and the show that kind of ties into our annual budget. Mainly that's due to the operating fund impact of, are we gonna use street maintenance funds or are we deferring maintenance on this because it's gonna be a capital project soon um, or repairs to a piece of equipment or, you know, you, there's many different scenarios there. You know, so the CIP allows for the evaluation of all potential projects at the same time. Um, you know, we try to stabilize debt, um, you know, consolidate projects. Um, you know, try, try to make it make sense. You know, if we've got a water issue, a sewer issue, a drainage issue, and a pavement issue, it makes sense to put that all into one instead of repaving a road just to dig it up two years later because we've got a water main problem. Um, you know, try to make it so it's a public relation so we can tell a neighborhood, you know, <coughs> yes, you have issues in your neighborhood, but in two years, it's in the plan to reconstruct it and we're able to follow through on that. Um, you know, we want to preserve the infrastructure we have and uh, make sure, again, we're using funds in the best manner possible and 
and also look at uh, cooperation. You know, we talk about uh, joint projects with other communities. Um, you know, to be able to do that, we have to look a couple years out and make sure that we both are budgeting for the same project at the same time. And uh, you know, as you look at grant applications, you're putting those together uh, as a joint effort as well. So, you know, so we list our projects, the equipment, um, we try to put them in the order of pr preference or priority. Um, kind of how the financing works. Um, and then with the projects in the packet, we had the, some of the justification explanation of the, of the project. So again, you know, with our utility projects, you know, it's maintaining reliable service, um, you know, whether it's the water supply, making sure we've got plenty of it with wells or capacity with towers, or even um, the treatment of it, making sure it's of an acceptable quality. Um, our sewer system, you know, a lot of that's capacity uh, driven. Uh, storm sewer, again, is uh, capacity as well as environmental compliance. Um, so again, uh, and then street maintenance and our capital plans, you know, they, can, they go together. Um, as, as I mentioned, if we have a street out there, we're trying to figure out, is it something that we're going to keep band-aiding and patching and bringing together, or are we going to rebuild it? Um, it helps to have that answer, you know, a couple of years ahead of time, so we're not uh, kind of chasing um, in spending, I guess, good money on a bad road. So again, you know, we have to look at the age of the street, the drainage, soil conditions, and um, if we're able to defer um, certain maintenance um, activities so that we then can take it on as a full capital project. So again, the, a good street maintenance project. Um, I guess, uh, just note, Trustee Feeney is here at uh, 437. You know, so the, a reliable program allows us to have that right maintenance effort at the right time. Um, you know, we can keep our good roads good and we're not uh, spending on roads that are planned to be reconstructed. So, you know, the, the worst thing I think is to be, spend a couple hundred thousand dollars on a road just to dig it up a couple years later and spend a million dollars on it. So just wanted to go back through some of those principles of what the capital program is and the, I guess, object behind it. So then in the packet, um, I did have this map kind of showing where some of these projects are over the next uh, five years. Uh, you know, we try to, I guess, space things out too and um, touch every part of the village. So it's, you know, people don't feel neglected or, um, you know, we're keep, keeping the entire village maintained as one. Um, so. Today, to, uh, to boost yep. sort of that uh, visibility, have you considered putting out um, putting out a notice in the utility bills? Hey, we're going to be working on these roads the next quarter. So, so that's part of it. Is once we, I guess, have that commitment then from the board again, saying, "Yep, move forward with this plan." We would publish this capital plan. You know, probably have a link to our website. People can. You know, learn about it. You know, um, we do have a back end kind of GIS application that's interactive where you can click on the year, click on a project, and it'll bring up pictures and a few descriptions of what, what that project entails. And, you know, kind of as a follow up, you know, I like to go back at some of the projects we have recently completed and kind of show what, what a finished product looks like. I think sometimes that, that, that helps people too to understand what. Um, what, what maybe is upcoming and why we're looking to take on a project. Okay, thank you. So then again, um, we had the spreadsheets uh, in the packet. I guess the main thing is um, just focusing on the streets and utility projects. There were park projects and building projects in here too. Um, I guess right now I'm just trying to get the utilities and the street portions gone through. So just want to just kind of step through each project one, one by one a little bit. If you have questions, let me know. If it's a simple project, I'll probably go through it fairly quickly. But, um, you know, the Birch Street project uh, from Cross Point to Shorey, uh, you know, that, that one's in the design phase. It should be bid here later this month with a bid award in March. Um, but again, the, the reason for that project was poor drainage. Um, there's a gap in the water system, um, just pavement conditions, and uh, looking to upgrade uh, the facility. 
So the 2022 projects, I guess, are kind of it, it, in progress. You know, the uh, Ross Avenue and Camp Phillips intersection, we had started that, uh, we have preliminary design that we did with the Marathon County Highway Department. Um, the County Highway Commissioner is working on getting proposals for the final design on this project. And then this would be one that we would be um, submitting a grant for uh, in an upcoming cycle here to get uh, hopefully some additional funding for this project. So it's not just our um, operating fund, but it's our borrowed monies for the general fund. It wasn't much of the right way they were asking, really, according to that drawing. Yeah, that correct. Um, I thought it was going to be more than that, but. Yeah, it'll be a little bit of right away, likely from the elementary school, and then on the property of the new municipal center. <coughs> it is not much, really. No, it's not. Oh. Yeah, so it, it actually, a roundabout fits in pretty pretty nice there. And right, yeah. Sh should help with the flow through that intersection. Um, you know, we had the Mesker Avenue or Ross Avenue repaving from Mesker to o the Eau Claire River. That's um, finishing up what uh, was started a couple of years ago, where we um, started at Birch Street and made it just past uh, Camp Phillips Road in 2020. Last year, we went from Camp Phillips to Mesker. And this year, the plan is to finish that stretch then from Mesker to the bridge. So. Oh. I think we should still cut the bicycle path from uh, Metro all the way to Bridge. Sure. Because that bicycle path at least about 10 years old, maybe more than that. Yeah. And usually I think they said every five years you should be still cutting on those. Yeah. Because I mean, protecting it, I think we should do that. And it's not an expensive proposition, really. Sure. Look at that. Um, well, seven and eight. Uh, yeah, another project that uh, should be out for bid here in the next month, but uh, that, that's installing new two new wells at the Camp Phillips uh, site just south of the disc golf course, which you know we, we talked about some of the design aspects of that this past year, and the big need for that was just making sure we had adequate capacity within our um, water system, so that was to meet uh, current need as well as um, projected growth. So how much is per minute pumping now for that well? Uh, Did they I believe pump? they can do 900 uh, or is it 750 if they're both running per minute. Correct. So 1500 between the two of them. That's good investment then. Yeah. So again, you know, it's, uh, making sure we're providing adequate water supply uh, to the community. And I, if I remember right, you said there isn't iron and manganese in there? The test well did not have iron and manganese in it, so. Over time may come out. It, it may start uh, showing itself once you start pumping, but uh, initially it looks pretty good. Hopefully it's a lot like well six and doesn't have anything. So again, that well is kind of by the disc golf course. Um, where, oh, yeah. So they're 900, I guess, each, sorry. Do you have a map to show each well, what area you serve? As far as when it's pumping, who gets the water? Right. I don't think you really, that, that, that might yeah. be tough to do. It's just yeah. is it mixed in the whole system, I guess, right? All of them connected together? Correct, yeah. Pretty much. We're one system. Um, you know, we got the three towers that they all pump to. So based on, you know, if there's more demand in one area of the village at a certain time, you know, water's gonna flow that way. Um, you know, if you're right next to the well, I guess it, you know, like you're up in Sandy Meadows, you're probably more likely getting water from the well up in Sandy Meadows, just because you're right there next to it and the only crossing of the river right now is at Ross. Um, but if you're in the middle of the village, it's it's kind of maybe a, a guess as far as which which well is giving you water at any given time. Yeah, I didn't think all of them were connected. I knew some of them definitely, yeah. but not all of them. So we do have the one well out by Cedar Creek, I guess, that's on an island that just serves Foremost and Red Mountain um, Sanitary District. Right. But otherwise, all the other wells are interconnected in the main system.
And then I guess the next project on there is the uh, Tratzer uh, lift station and the Ryan Street lift station. Uh, last month, we um, recommended approval on those construction contracts. So um, I guess the Tratzer station is just a new one to serve that area on the north side of the river. Then the Eau Claire station has upgrades to the existing pipe piping, um, emergency generator, and uh, some other electrical um, updates to the um, station. So, and and just some site grading to minimize uh, the flooding of the. I, think just, I just have to interrupt and ask. Yep, go ahead. What is a hole in the river? <laughs> For, well, when they did the survey, the you know the bottom of the river is like this, and all of a sudden. It, there was a hole. Oh, a hole in the river. I don't know. A, a deep spot. I was, I was wondering that myself. I had to. Ask. Yeah. I, I mean, the river kind of diverts right there. Sure. It goes I, from. Yeah, I just the main. To, it occurred to me, and I had to ask. Yeah. It could be in the main channel, and the water washing off maybe the hole. Or yeah. The it's top of the soil it's it's just the odd that the one yeah. spot that we would have needed to cross was where the deep spot was. So. This is why we can't have nice things. Uh, apparently, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so again, the Kathleen lift station, it's a very small um, service area on that one, but just some wiring and electrical component updates. That station that we'll be looking at later this year, uh, it really just serves a small portion of the area off of uh, Camp Phillips Road and north of like uh, Stein Eye Center. Right. Uh, and then we've got some repaving on uh, Community Center Drive. Um, really, that's similar to the kind of what was done on Barbican last year, where there's curb failing, there's um, wheel rutting, there's inlet failures. Um, just trying to keep that uh, <coughs> facility up um, with uh, some of the pavement uh, issues it's having. And uh, the day I was gonna go out and take pictures, it snowed, so I apologize, I didn't have a great picture of uh, that. But if you look close enough along this curb line, you can see it kind of bounces up and down the entire way. Um, and there's differential settling to the asphalt and the curb, so trying to take care of those. Um, you know, they come plow hazards, and then also it's spots where the water settles, and continues to um, create potholes and uh, extensive cracking of the pavement. Um, so then we're also looking at uh, repaving Zinzer Street from Schofield Ave to Highway 29 uh, in the business park. Um, so again, just spots where the wheel ruts, there's popping of the seal coat and um, I guess just overall trying to keep that pavement. It's one of the main routes in and out of the business park. Um, as people use Zinzer to get to Schofield Ave. And then uh, Stone Ridge Drive is another one. Um, oh, this is over by the hospital off of Westview Boulevard. Um, kind of, you know, last year we repaved Westview. This kind of continues that uh, up towards the hospital section. And there's stripping of the seal coat, uh, potholes there. And then uh, this picture of here we got fairly wide gaps in the joints of the concrete uh, curb, and then also um, maybe hard to tell in the picture. But again, there's probably a good inch or so difference between the curb height and the asphalt height, so water doesn't get off the pavement uh, completely, and it leads to a kind of break, further breakdown during the freeze thaw cycle in the spring. So then some of the equipment that we're looking at uh, this coming year. Oh, go ahead. You have uh, repaving or? So, so it would be like uh, removing the, the whatever, four or five inches of asphalt and repaving. Right, but uh, you don't uh, show you have or this later coming up. That probably be later. But then, anyway, you're doing shorty from Camp Phillips to Perry. Correct. Why don't you go to Ryan? That's it, that's fine. Good. You, you, you can you can suggest that. No, it is bad. I mean, I know it, it is, is bad. bad. I know that area well because I ride on those bikes all the time. And yep. And some of those areas really bad. I mean, 
Yeah, so, so again, there's other streets out there that we're not even showing here, but it, again, it's that balance of where, you know, so this is just the staff recommendation and I guess that's where we are looking for that feedback of anything that you guys have additional. You know, I, we, we stopped at here and just because I think some people mainly will go to here and then they'll take here and up to uh, Western Avenue where they go south then into Cronenwater off of it. I don't know how many people continue on that all the way to Ryan Street or even Zinzer. A lot, okay. a lot. But even the drift traffic in there from Ryan, uh, from Ryan to Zinzer, there isn't much because I don't think there's that many houses in there. No, there's not. And there's not really a whole lot in between even here and in Ryan, but mainly well well in there. It's some on the south side, but that's yeah. uh, not on the north. Correct, yeah. <clears throat> okay. All right. So then, you know, is it talk about equipment, you know, an asphalt roller, um, and then a cold planer, mill skid steer attachment. You know, these two pieces of equipment kind of work in tandem uh, with a lot of our asphalt wedging. You know, so in this picture, it shows where you know, kind of go through, you mill out the wheel path, and then you come back and uh, pave it in. Our existing roller is, um, I don't know, over 30 years old, and it, we stopped using it because it just doesn't work. It's inoperable. Um, so we've been renting these pieces of equipment. This past year, we spent about nine thousand dollars in rental fees um, on this. So, uh, as we look at moving forward, um, we only see the need to continue doing this more and more. And it probably makes sense to, um, I guess, have a roller and then the mill head in house that we can use um, and hold hold on to for the next you know, twenty five years. So there's the, this is actually on Shorey Avenue, just west of here. And um, so was the rented roller this past summer. And on the end loader, we actually did purchase already this year. I'll skip over that. And we got um, a pickup truck. Uh, just again, uh, there's nothing special about this one. Um, it does have a diesel or a exterior diesel tank on it that we've used to fill up our equipment when it's off site. So we can fill up the tank on the back of this truck and then go fill up you know, an excavator or an end loader that's somewhere else uh, working. So that was the 22 projects. So those are the ones ongoing or in the process of uh, getting bid here. Then 23, um, we had submitted the, a grant, a joint grant with the town of Weston to uh, reconstruct uh, Ross Avenue from River Bend Road out to uh, Paul's Ave, which is just on the north side of Mock Miller Park. Um, so this would also include a multi-use path, uh, likely a roundabout at the Kramer-Ross intersection and uh, water uh, and sewer utility extensions on this project. So we should be hearing back uh, later in March, uh, early April, hopefully, as to whether or not we did get a grant for it. Um, I know the town of Weston has indicated they won't be able to really move forward with this project unless there is a grant fund tied to it. So if we don't receive the local road improvement funds for this project, I could foresee us submitting this for the new round of the um, federal infrastructure um, funding. So, this road is uh, classified as an arterial in the urban area, so it would uh, would fit that criteria. Right. Yeah, here's just some of the reasons for looking at redoing this intersection. This star is here, so if you're at this stop sign and you're looking back, you really can't see traffic coming. And uh, same thing here, if you're thinking you're, you want to go straight on Kramer, you can't really see cars coming around the corner the other way. So. We get a lot of reports of near misses at that intersection. Um, yeah, I drive. Um, I drive on that road from time to time. Is there a way for us to make the curve a little more visible, or would that run relatively expensive pretty quick? Uh, my understanding is the town has uh, talked to the property owner, kind of on the 
northwest corner to see if they would allow us to cut trees back further. And uh, they were not willing to let that happen. So okay. I'm sure there's some other things we could look at doing. As far as, you know, I know sometimes you place that intersection, you know, you kind of split it. You don't have the two wings. You right. try to take it to the middle. Um, I guess we, doesn't look like we have any traction on a big project anytime soon. I guess, yeah, we'd be looking at what other things <coughs> could make to try to improve it in the interim. Or uh, could we even put out a uh, slow blind curve sign just to reduce potentially reduce the risk of uh, near misses we can do that too um i know i've always been told signage is only as effective as people read it but um it doesn't hurt i suppose yeah can you actually the report on that um we looked there wasn't really any major accident reports a lot of it was slide offs like in winter um like people tra traveling too fast for conditions um, so luckily there was not you know, the T-bone the type of incident, but um, I, I think it's only a matter of time probably before there is something like that. Um, and another one here is uh, Birch Street uh, between Jelnick and Community Center Drive. Uh, so this is a connection uh, between Jelnick Ave on the north side of Community Center. Um, kind of Closing that gap, uh, the pedestrian bridge ends right here and it kind of ends any pedestrian accommodations if you're trying to get to Schofield Ave as well after you cross over Highway 29. So the thought would be to try to continue a sidewalk or a multi-use path at least in that stretch to get you to um, the Jelnick intersection where then there is sidewalk that would take you to um, Schofield Avenue. And uh, with more Development uh, on the horizon, uh, just off of uh, Birch Street here. Um, likely later this year, I'm sure traffic and other items are only gonna pick up in this area. So uh, just trying to make the road a little better. And uh, there's also some drainage issues along the Colonial Gardens uh, right away that we'll be looking to clean up with some stormwater improvements as well. Then we got some uh, just asphalt overlays in the Windermere Oak subdivision. So again, okay. roads that are about 24 uh, years old, just showing their age. We've got some alligator cracking. Um, they're low volume streets, so um, thought is usually just an overlay on these seem to hold up fairly well, as and they don't need a full um, pavement uh, replacement. And then. Uh, Probably the biggest utility project after the wells uh, seven and eight is our is looking at the bladel and uh, Alta Verde well iron and manganese removal plant to be located at the bladel well site. So this project would um, pump the water from the Alta Verde well over to bladel. Alta Verde is over at Kennedy Park. We pump it over to bladel where then uh, an iron manganese removal plant would be created. And then uh, hopefully have much better quality water coming out of that facility into the system. Uh, this project would also require uh, or likely require the reconstruction of Bladel Avenue, at least to a, a certain extent as the water main on Bladel is only eight inch. And if we um, have a treatment facility there, we'd want a larger diameter pipe to get that out into the system. You know, this was, and as we look at uh, other upcoming, I guess, water quality, you know, I think Josh may touch on a little bit. Um, you know, there's other movements on uh, what, what should be removed from our water. So we'll have to look at all that before we, I guess, get too far in design, but we'd like to uh, get that going. So as soon as wells seven and eight are online, we likely um, get wells one and five um, going with the treatment plant. And then as part of our uh, Western Avenue corridor um, projects plans, we'd have the uh, Eastern half of that project from Ryan Street out to uh, County Road J, uh, potentially here in 2023 as well. Um, a big part of that water system there is looping. There's current 
um, deficient fire flows out in the business park section on that in the east end. So um, getting that completed helps uh, helps reinforce the system for the businesses out there. Um, and then again, some further um, just repaving in the business park, uh, taking care of the wheel ruts, the potholes, um, items such as those. And then as far as equipment goes, uh, just uh, a one-ton truck. Those are generally used for plowing cul-de-sacs, um, hauling our uh, patchier, our concrete materials, our um, trailers, um, getting our small equipment from point A to point B. So. so those are the main ones, uh, the 22, 23 projects. And then 24, we start getting, I guess maybe a little more hypothetical, theoretical. Um, <coughs> Fuller Street is in there. Uh, that is a project that, uh, again, it's a minor arterial in our classified system. Um, there was a thought with the Schofield F corridor plan to realign the intersection of Fuller on the north side and um, try to maybe cut it through Aero Sports Club and Weston Lanes so it would line up with uh, Old Costa Lane on the south side. So it'd be, a, I guess, a, a four way um, intersection there. So if that's something we still want to pursue or not, I guess that'd be further discussion. But um, there's also some, again, some fire flow uh, deficiencies on Fuller, uh, mainly just due to a small diameter pipe near some industrial uses. Now the pavement's in okay shape. Um, there is cracking, some rotting, um, and uh, we'd be looking at uh, pedestrian improvements along here too to help uh, kind of connect to this corridor. Um, the dog park is off of Fuller here. A lot of people tend to walk there from the surrounding neighborhoods, so it's trying to reduce the amount of people in the vehicle conflicts. And Ross Avenue uh, between Metro and uh, Alderson Street, that was a, another uh, project we submitted recently with the City of Schofield for the Local Road Improvement Program. <coughs> and we'll be finding out if we receive any funding for that project in about a month here. And uh, again, that's one that likely the project will be dependent on when we can get grant funding for it. So, uh, in an ideal world, we'd look at it as a 24 project, but it could be moved uh, later. Uh, one of the issues there, uh, as this picture depicts, uh, semi is currently turning onto Ross off of Metro Drive here. Have to utilize the oncoming lanes. So if you have cars kind of stacked up there, it takes a little while of coordination before people understand that they either need to just go so that the semi can go and then the cars behind them need to not go and wait for the semi truck to turn. So um, part of that, we looked at possibly installing roundabouts at that intersection as well as the Alderson Street intersection as well to help with some of those turning movements. And then uh, a local road aspect of, in that year or two is looking at Everest Avenue uh, from Volkman Street to Alta Verde. So this is a main route between the junior high and the high school. Um, again, it's got a larger diameter water main that's about uh, 50 to 60 years old. Um, so just be looking to replace that and help uh, reinforce the water system uh, through that Everest area. And the, the road's not in the worst shape, but uh, probably in about four years, it's not going to be any better. And then some overlays and some uh, the Crane Meadows and Sand Hill Meadows neighborhood. So um, again, these roads were paved in 96, 97. Um, I've got several spots that look like this, just where the crown of the road's kind of inverted and it's created a low spot. So water settles there and it over time, it just keeps breaking apart, so. And then as we look at the utilities, um, we'll be looking at a new water tower on Weston Avenue. Um, they'd be there to replace the summit tower. Uh, it'd be located right here by the hospital. Uh, it's kind of the emergency room entrance. Weston Avenue is here. This is that WPS and our gas line um, station. So that was one of the other deficiencies in our water system study was a lack of um, storage. So this would be 
um, creating that storage um, in the system that's needed. And then uh, another Weston Avenue, Alderson to Birch Street. Uh, again, that was another joint project with the Village of Rothschild um, that we submitted a grant for. So we'll see, the, see what that uh, outcome is. And again, a, a component besides the road here is uh, looping the water main. Currently, we have water main on Alderson Street that serves this part of Rothschild. Uh, water main on Birch Street, and then nothing here in the middle. So it would be connecting those two, um, which would be key for that water tower then getting built in that area as well. And then again, um, I guess if the time works out, people might not like us because Weston Avenue will be under construction on uh, the east side of Camp Phillips as well, from Camp Phillips to Ryan Street as part of the um, Weston Avenue corridor project. So. And we have a replacement plow truck um, in the queue there. And uh, I can keep going, but I think we got through the major projects. But uh, if anybody has other questions on these ones, um, some of the main ones of note is, uh, get there. I guess the Schofield Avenue, um, I guess here's Shorey Avenue that Boucher mentioned, that was from Camp Phillips to Huron. So again, we had it as a 2025 project. So if you think we should be going further, we can definitely look at adding um, another, was that a half mile, three quarters of a mile out to Ryan? What's the name of that road over there? This one? Yeah, that was the YMCA. Yeah, that's it? Woodland. Yep. Yeah, that, uh, I would drive it sometimes back out there. But... Yeah, and that, so, so that was one of these projects I skipped over here. Uh, so that was repaving Woodland <coughs> and Howland out to the Y. So going from Camp Phillips and just following it all the way out to Shorey. It won a stretch over the, I don't know how many times you repair it. But uh, it does fall apart continuously. Yeah, it does. Um, you know, there's sections there that just need to be dug out and put back in. You know, there's topsoil and other things that we found just to put some culverts in there underneath the road. So um, not, not in great shape. Um, right. I guess one other one, my understanding is um, the DOT is looking at uh, redoing Business 51 in uh, 2025, 2026. I tell you it was 24. I think it's 25. But I guess either way, um, the, the city of Schofield and the village of Rothschild have already um, hired an engineer to work on their water and sewer aspect of that project. Um, I believe we probably should tag team with that uh, just because we're in the middle. We've got Rothschild to the south and Schofield to the north. Who's doing it? Uh, they have Becker Hoppy doing their um, water and sewer designs. So. I think just for continuity on that project, we should probably be looking to uh, uh, get that going too, so that the coordination with the DOT is done um, easily, easily and ahead of time, and we're not having, you know, three separate uh, design engineers working on um, a project where things <coughs> cracks and we could end up with some issues. Is it uh, our part is from where to where? Um, so ours would be starting at like Volkman Street where um, like the BP and the Festival Foods is. Yeah. And then it'd go all the way to um, like Walgreens. Oh. So that's the... It's on the... Okay. Yeah, well, I got a map. I don't know. So yeah, so we start right here, just a little south of Jelnick. So south of us is Rothschild and then uh, Kind of right here by Walgreens is where then the city of Schofield begins. Yeah, there's a metering station. Okay. Our sewer metering station is down kind of by um, what used in front of what used to be Hardy's. It's now what, Clean Slate Coffee. Mm -hmm. Shop the Shopko building, Coral Lanes. Yeah, there's a little sanitary sewer metering station there. So um, there's. In this stretch, we have a sewer main, and so does the village of Rothschild. And then ours goes through the metering station, and theirs continues on. Uh, Summit Tower. And then some more business park paving. Um, I guess then Schofield Avenue. I know that was top of that came up with the plan commission. Um, you know, the 
I, I guess the main thing is in this corridor, we've had several concrete repair projects um, over the last almost 10 years. Uh, it seems like every time we do one, um, the next year, more cracks appear in the joint that we did not repair the previous year. Um, so this is one of those projects where you know, trying to get a commitment on a certain time frame so we understand what level of effort we put into the maintenance of the road. Um, you know, th this stretch right here is about $25,000 worth of repairs over about 275 feet, I do believe. So um, th those costs can add up real quickly. Um, so if we know, you know, a, a street like this is going to be redone in 25, 26, 27, somewhere in that time frame. We understand how much effort needs to go into keeping it passable until then. So, and then there's also some flooding issues um, or undersized storm sewer and some water and sewer aspects that we probably look at updating as well. So, uh, but then we've got another treatment plan for the Mesker well um, later on at the end of this. So, so overall, our I think there's a lot, a lot in there, but um, I guess the, the goal was to see if there, we can get you know, some of those projects endorsed or certain years endorsed to move forward with. Or, um, like I said, the 2023 projects, um, to a certain extent, maybe the water treatment, at least for the Bladel Alta Verde wells, um, so we can get um, RFPs out there for design. It's just. Looking for any feedback specifically, or if there's other projects we want to bring back. Looking for any suggestions. Uh, uh, I, didn't, I didn't recall the road rating on the, the one you're going to do on uh, was it between Ross and Phillips, the other that stretch. We're, we're down at Bob, we're, we're going down to the bridge from the last stretch. Oh, the last section of Ross there? Yeah. Uh, top of my head, I'd probably say it's probably a six. Um, yeah, I don't think I had it there. Um, Pacer rating, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, that's right around a six. Okay. It, it, that was my only question. If that one was a little bit be deferred a little bit in favor of maybe some water through to the project. But. Yeah, but uh, I guess funding wise, they're, so, they're two separate things. Water, sewer has one funding, streets have another. It's blossoming right now. Is it? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're starting to let loose in there. We milled part of that out in 19, some patches and patched it, but it's the stripping, it's starting to let loose again, though, the rest of it. What about those area near the street and those which we were talking about it and they were going to do that the wall plan? Uh, Nick Avenue? Mm -hmm. Nick, we have to get a meeting with uh, Village of Corn and Water. Uh, we're trying to set a meeting up, meeting up with the two, two chief elected officials, the administrators, and the public works directors to talk about mutual responsibility on that. Is it capital improvement there? Yes, and Cornwater. Yeah, we're on the right. north side, and Cornwater's on the south side. <laughs> we're really only we're only trying to focus on the existing piece of it, not make not the connection at this point in time. Right. The J. Yeah. But if there's development that's proposed down there, the connection would be something that's probably very desirable. Yeah, you got that 90 degree turn right at the end and there. And over here, and you get to the avenue. Yep. Well, at the end of here, so that's West Nick. So we're on the other side that only comes off of Kamichik. Yeah. I mean, that would be, I guess, that, that could be a project we could take on with our own staff. Know, if we're only looking at two and a half mile there. Um, we did the previous mile, mile and a half. One, two, 
Yeah, we did about a, a mile in 2012 with the village of Cronenwater with our own forces. Um, so I guess that, that was kind of the initial thought is we'd look at utilizing our own staff to build that road up. Okay. Any questions? All right. Michael, you covered item seven, right? Um, I can hear the, I guess the main part is um, some of the federal infrastructure funding, the bipartisan infrastructure law came out. Um, for federal fiscal year 2022, they're looking for projects that are, I guess, shovel ready. Oh, didn't mean to click on that. Um, I don't know if we have anything specifically that meets that uh, criteria where we'd have to have plan specifications estimate done by August 1st. Um, the streets have to be on our classified system, so it should be a collector or arterial street. Um, we've got a whole bunch in our CIP that we just went through that do meet that criteria. Um, all the joint projects with the town of Weston, city of Schofield, village of Rothschild uh, meet that criteria as well as Fuller Street, um, the other Birch Street project. Uh, Schofield Avenue. Um, so I, I foresee us submitting several grants in the near future. Um, I, I just don't know if there's anything that we'd be able to turn around for August 1st of this year um, for this project cycle. But uh, it looks like they'll be continuing this through um, speculation is 2025. So um, there's many projects in there that we'll be submitting and um, hopefully getting uh, some funding for. So then uh, I guess just the update uh, and other projects. Uh, we did have the Weston Avenue uh, first public information meeting. Uh, some of you were there. If you weren't and wanted to uh, uh, see what information was had or given out, um, you can type in westonwi.gov backslash Weston Avenue, the presentations on there, the a video, um, the slides, the handouts. Uh, I think overall, pretty good uh, attendance. So the main, real, really, the main topic seemed to be the water and sewer assessments on the project. And, uh, well, then I think the path too. Yeah, I, I mean, you had the res some residents who thought, you know, this is great. I, I don't see them walking on the road right now, so. I, I, they would welcome a path on their road, and I think other people thought it was unnecessary. Um, but I guess we can. It, it is one of those things that Weston Avenue is an arterial street. Our code does say we need to provide pedestrian accommodations, separate it from the street um, for arterial streets. So um, I, I guess whether it's one path or it, otherwise, it'd be two sidewalks if, if we're following that criteria and the arterial streets. So. And I think with it being a utility maintenance road as well as a multi-use path, it makes sense since it is only a two-lane road. Uh, if we have to clean clean the sewers, work on the hydrants in the future, we're not blocking a lane of traffic or off there. So, um, but yeah, but yes, yeah, the the path I guess was another another item that was questioned, the necessity for it. Are some of the utility projects and well 78 will be meeting with AECON this week to finalize the bid documents and that should be going out as well so in next month we should have several project uh, bid openings uh, here for you guys to go over and consider okay. I can get on talking for a little while. <laughs> all right we cover item seven, right? Correct, yep. Item eight. Any question for Michael? All right, thank you, Michael. Item eight is street operation update. Um, yeah, winter's pretty much taking care of most of our time right now. The roads, we've got patching to do. Hopefully, tomorrow we'll get at some of it. We get that wet snow, that last one, kind of roads are taking a beating. So, uh, we've got some snow to haul up. We have two up by the hospital and get done. So it's just typical winter work pretty much. 
uh, took some trees down. We've got some more brushing to do in that. We're working on that in between. Uh, Mitch King and Sons are finishing up the crushing out at Ryan Street, uh, around 13,000 tons of three quarter inch recycled gravel was made. They're crushing a six inch minus breaker now. They should be getting done with that shortly. Uh, I put some numbers together just for what it cost us to haul snow in January and February cleaning the streets. You can see it came to about $89,000. I have the guys track how much, how many loads they carry each day and how many cubic yards of snow approximately go into a truckload. And that's about what it came up to, 16,655 yards of snow haul. So um, if we knew it wasn't going to snow anymore the rest of the year, we'd probably be, maybe could have made it. But if you go up by the hospital, I'll even too and see we've got to pull some of that snow away because the drains are all blocked or like it's along the curb. So it's just one of the things that we do. Um, we're going to be using, putting this stuff in the new snow dump that we made, which is on the south side of Weston Avenue, just uh, east of Ministry Parkway, where the new water tower site's going to go later. So we'll be utilizing that now. Uh, doing some equipment training. We've got, oh, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Is this all our staff here doing it, or is it a contract? No, it's all our own stuff. Yeah, okay. Our, our equipment. And just so you understand how we do it, to come up with that number, their wages, we know what the gross cost of the wages is. For the equipment, we use the Wisconsin DOT average unit price for that piece of equipment. It's the same thing that the counties use that when they do work for DOT. You know, they sign up. $3 million contract every year. The, the state takes every county, when they buy a piece of equipment, they take the total cost of that piece of equipment. So if it's a new truck, it's sized by typically weight of the truck or how many axles. They compile that from all 72 counties, all the fuel, the repairs, the parts and everything go into it and divide it out. And that's how they come up with this number. Everything, every piece of equipment has got a classification. It's got a, a rate. And those are the numbers that I use to come up with this cost. You know, it's it's probably as accurate as you're gonna get on something, so. And these are all hauled to the Bridge Street at the end of I-29, I-29 and the Bridge uh, Most of it went to Bridge Street, yes. Mm -hmm. And some of it does go out to Ryan Street. We take it out to, to there and we dumped quite a bit out there. And uh, Mack Miller Park was another. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, I saw that when they were doing the other so. Yeah. Yeah. Try to get the closest haul. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we're doing some equipment training too. Uh, you'll see on there Kyle Hollenbrock. He's our latest employee that we hired. He's the mechanic uh, that we just hired. So now we're up to full staff, 10 employees on the DPW Street Department. So, um, and then next is the. These are the contracts that are going to be going out. Bid opening is going to be around the 9th of March is what we're shooting for. And there's a map that I put together that shows the different asphalt overlays, uh, GSB surface treatment. That's uh, basically like a seal coat or not, yeah, like a seal coat. And then chip sealing on streets, ones that are going to be done. The red ones up in Sandy Metals is going to be chip sealing up there. The uh, GSB is going to be um, the Everest Edition streets that were paved anywhere from three to five years ago. That's what we're trying to do. It's a preservation method. It's the same same treatment that we used on Schofield Avenue from Ryan Street two years ago, going out to Highway G. That got the GSB 88 spray on it, so it helps rejuvenate the asphalt and preserve it. So. Those of contracts will be going out and hopefully we'll have bids back and, and have some numbers for you to look at at the March meeting. Okay, question? I just had a, just a question out of curiosity. Did we had spalling on the on the, the bridge over um, <clears throat> on Ross um, over, over by Bobble. And just I I just happened to see a thing from where they've got uh, a product now that apparently is a composite rebar that um, mm -hmm. doesn't rust. And I was just curious if that's anything that, that we would consider in the future. And I don't even know if it's appropriate for bridges, but. Yeah, and I, I don't know. You know, they went from the age of that bridge is from 79. I think it was 79 that bridge was built. 
And that was all black bar, it wasn't coated. Then after that, they went to all epoxy coated rebar, which helped reduce that. I, I've, I've worked with people that have used that in residential purposes, but I don't know if it's got the same tensile strength as what they require on the bridges, like a, yeah, a grade 60 no bar would have. Yeah. I, I just was curious, because if we had just gone through that and the problems you encountered, so. Yeah. They did put, and I don't know if you remember this, on the bridge on the east side when they re worked that whole east edge, they put the anodes in that are gonna help give it the cathodic protection, so hopefully it'll reduce how fast the rebar deteriorates. Same thing you put on an underground fuel tank, the old steel ones. Yep. Used to have one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Took up five years ago. <laughs> Anything else? Josh? <clears throat> sure. It was uh, a fairly quiet month, I suppose, for our utility guys in regards to some of the uh, diggers hotline and work orders. Kind of freed them up a little bit to um, take care of some of the... Uh, Maintenance work, I suppose, with some of the wells and uh, and uh, lift stations, a lot of uh, feed line replacements and some heaters that went out that they had to kind of maintain. Getting after some of the um, repainting, epoxy painting, some of our piping that's within some of the well houses. Um, our SCADA system we had, AECOM, is, uh, was in town um, the last week of January into the first week of February going to all of our Wells Towers lift stations to um, get a plan together for us to prepare an RFP so we can get it out, so we can get our SCADA system usable again. So hopefully, um, I guess we're meeting with Angel with AECOM later this week, we'll maybe get an idea of what uh, what's in store for the SCADA um, RFP when we have might have something in our hands for that as well. Um, like I said, water, sewer stuff is just kind of some maintenance items. Um, we did do our annual uh, meter change outs as well. I believe we just wrapped those up yesterday or this morning. Yesterday. Yesterday. So we had our inch and a half, two inch meter change outs. Um, we're also doing the testing on the ones that we swapped out currently. Some of our miscellaneous activities uh, completed and upcoming. We'll be touching on this in a minute here, but we'll be collecting uh, some PFAS sampling, PFAS specific sampling in the next uh, coming week or so. Um, our guys went through and entered our monthly EMOR data. They're still working on some of the light change outs and doing some upgrades to some of our uh, wells and lift stations. Um, doing some painting, like I had mentioned, we're working on sprucing up the treatment plant in Sternberg Wellhouse. Um, our guys uh, did assist the street crews uh, when we had a little downtime with some of their uh, snow removal operations as well. Um, Michael touched on most of our uh, contract work. One of them that wrapped up was our, uh, our carry well uh, phosphorus investigation. We got the final report prepared by uh, Process Research Solutions, Abigail, put that together, submitted to the DNR. We have to kind of respond with a few um, future outlooks of what we're going to plan for with that well at uh, Cary Foremost, formerly Foremost. Um, Michael touched on our setup well 7 and 8. We'll be meeting with uh, Angel this week, like I said, SCADA, I mentioned. We met with uh, Clark Dietz last week for, we're going to be bringing our meter pits for our mobile home parks to the surface. So we met with uh, Clark Dietz this past week to get an idea of what we want to do with them, where we want to put them, what they want to, what they should look like. So, um, and then Tanya Trisha, uh, lift station reconstruction was in a break. It resumed last week, might have been the week before, um, getting some of the mechanical stuff. Um, so that hopefully doesn't have to go into another break. I think they should be good to go. We're still waiting on a generator, so there's some things we need to figure out with that yet as well. And uh, our Apache River Crossing is in a shutdown for probably another month or two, I would think. Um, going forward, we got some of our customers added, uh, kind of our water pump data that we had. And I think I said last month, we'd like to have more data for you guys, but that didn't happen this month. So hopefully we can get a little more data. Um, 
available to you guys in the next couple months here. Question for Josh? Wouldn't you anticipate the Western Trail being fully open? Is that going to probably remain closed over by a, uh, the river crossing there? Mm -hmm. I think they are they going to try to reopen it after they secured the. They, they had to leave in some dewatering piping. Yeah. I guess I haven't been out there. I thought it would have been maybe reopened. I don't know if we needed to remove some stuff. I, don't know. I was about there pretty recently and it's okay. It's still closed and the piping was all out. And, and I'm not sure it was supposed to be out there, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, either way, that's not a good sign. We should either yeah, see if it's supposed to be open or closed, I guess. We'll have to see they have a sign up, but it, it's not a real, like, super. <laughs> not yeah. visible. I kind of went, oh, is this closed? <laughs> Why is it closed? Okay. I know, even during, I know even during construction, there's people that, you know, walking right past the excavator and, <laughs> you know, while they're actively digging. So. Yep, that's why I was curious how long it was going to be. Sure. <laughs> All right, policy discussion and recommendation. Well, I'll don't touch on, I got a little little extra note on our PFAS uh, stuff here. So, okay. I guess at our last meeting, uh, I kind of put together a little PowerPoint, kind of showing where we were at after one of our neighbors had um, found some PFAS in their wells. So, it was just kind of a, a quick PowerPoint thrown together. So. Um, after we found out last week, another neighbor had found PFAS in their well. We determined it was probably time that we put something out. So Keith had reached out to some of the board and committee members, and we kind of, you know, put together um, our understanding of what we should be doing, what we are doing, and what has been done in the past. So what Michael has up there now is the press release that was put out um, Friday. I think we put it out Friday afternoon. Um, just kind of addressing, you know, some of the important points about PFAS and Weston's uh, water utility where, you know, there was some samples conducted back on our UCMR3. Um, um, the samples that were uh, collected there were under the, you know, the proposed DNR um, limits of that 20 parts per trillion. Um, that's kind of getting our, our neighbor was kind of following along with. so. We've reached out with and had discussions with Northern Lakes Testing, who um, actually did our UCMR3 sampling and testing um, in 14 and 15. So we have the, the pricing put together. Um, there's an upcoming webinar on Wednesday with Kyle Burton, who's uh, an engineer with the DNR, um, where we can maybe get a little more guidance as to what's coming down the, the road here for, I guess, on the DNR side, potentially. It's, it's, a, it's a tricky situation when there's really nothing set in stone for regulations we have to follow. We will be doing sampling, like I had mentioned, um, you know, hopefully either tomorrow or Wednesday, maybe after the webinar, if we get some more information, we'll be ordering up the kits get out there end of this week or next week when we can get our, our our sample kits together and get out there and get them submitted and get them turned around and I guess we'll see what we what we find um, I guess I'm not sure if you guys have any questions for what we're going to be doing or what's going to be coming up or how we should be informing the public our website does have on the bottom of our press release we have a link to our website that um, also has links to the EPA website for more information, the DNR website, the uh, Wisconsin Department of Health Services, the, uh, that uh, PowerPoint I put together that kind of has some of the, the same material in it as well. So it's kind of at the, I feel like we're at the starting point of it, but people want us to be at the finish line where we're kind of still kind of swimming through the weeds a little bit here. So um, we'll have a lot more information once we take some samples and kind of see where we sit. So. Are you, I was kind of anticipating you were expecting not to find any any contamination over the level. I don't want to say that. I, mean, I, I, sure, I think it'll be way too early to think. Which road? I, I mean, you're testing for, what was it, five, five to six years ago, show it down? Yeah, correct. Yeah. And, you know, the, the method they used back then was this EPA 537. Um, 
Now there's a 537.1. I haven't been able to determine if it's actually different or if it's just wasn't reported as that back in the UCMR3. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it, it's, I guess we need to determine what, what PFAS they will be taking on to. I know the DNR has kind of stated there's four to six PFAS that are gonna be kind of this cumulative concentration level you're gonna be targeting. Um, but the EPA is different, so we kind of want to make sure we um, follow the regulations and standards that are set. Um, and we don't—not that we're hiding anything. It's—it's it's just that we have the information we have, and we'll get some samples here in the near term, and we'll go from there. Uh, I think the biggest problem is that there is no regulation yet. The DNR is supposed to make their recommendation in maybe in March this year, as soon as March, and then I think it goes to the legislature. There's some speculation the legislature is not going to do anything with it until the EPA comes out with their uh, recommendation, which would be the normal way these things go. But um, you know, I guess we have to think about what we do if we find something over 20 parts per trillion. Wausau is having a meeting tomorrow. Their water and sewer, their water and sewer commission. Um, but you know, these just the other thing is these compounds have been around since the nineteen forties. How much is the what did they? How much did they find out? Part of the million or billion? Who? Wausau. I think they had a range kind of in the middle, yeah. in the forty parts per trillion range. Uh, I guess uh, my question is, uh, why did we wait, um, or why haven't we tested since 2015? No requirement. It's not a regulation. And there's no standard to even go by if you do get uh, hit. What you know? What do you compare it to? There's nothing really. Yeah. I mean, that's what these UCMRs are kind of based on. Is you know, back to the UCMR three, they were in there probably, you know without the knowledge of anybody actually sampling them that maybe it could turn into something like this down the road. You know, so we had the UCMR5 that's coming out in 23, I believe we're gonna be taking samples where there'll be an additional 30 unregulated contaminants, which 29 of those will be PFAS with the other one being lithium. So I don't know if we need to start, I won't even <laughs> say. What, what normally happens, so uh, that's that's under the Safe Drinking Water Act where they, there was an amendment to the Safe Drinking Water Act where they decided they would pick a list of five, or a list of contaminants, unregulated contaminants every five years to in investigate as to whether or not a health standard should be set. So that's what UCR Mark 3 was. And now we're going to be doing UCR Mark 5. I don't know what was in four, I don't remember. But they, nothing to do with PFAS. They do, you know, so they do these things just on the protocol of, you know, creating regulations, maximum contaminant level for different different uh, constituents. And um, they come up with a regulation, they normally have an implementation date then for compliance. And I think that's sometimes as much as three years after they first identify that, that there's an exceedance in there. So it's a hard thing to just snap your fingers and, and do it. And I guess you don't really, I guess it's a catch-22 and you want to get out in front of it, not really knowing what the regulation's going to be. And probably the reality is that, that people have been exposed to these since, the, like I said, the 1940s. Everybody had a non-stick pen. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's not just your <laughs> drinking water, it's in the air, in the soil. Right. Fish, it to measure all these to part to measure. If it's big enough, they can go that far. Then they went part to the trillion. Now it's part to the trillion. And it's was it one of the um, articles we read to, to explain a part per trillion. Like if from the earth to the sun, six inches is a part per trillion. So, um, so, so I don't know. 
It's, it's re real, real, real small. It defies the imagination. Yeah. You know, 20 parts per trillion is like 10 feet off the Earth on your way to the sun. So. All right. Anything else, Josh? I, I mean, I guess not. You know, we'll be we'll be keeping the, that website updated for the PFAS stuff, you know, once we have sampling. Um, and, yeah, we'll, we'll just have a lot more information available on it all the social medias and everything. And, you know, once once we have some more of these webinars and once the DNR and EPA have some, some set schedules of when things are gonna be, you know, you know, put the put the hammer down and say, this is what you have to do, then, you know, it's gonna be. So Wednesday's the webinar, right? Correct. Yep. Yeah, and I think tomorrow WASA has, like Keith mentioned, WASA has a, another press conference, I think, to, kind of clear the air on some things that might have got misconstrued when their first press release last week. And then, yeah, DNR is putting on a webinar Wednesday, so. What time is that? Uh, 11.30. Is that one hour, two hours? Not sure. It's probably like an hour and a half. Yeah. yeah. It's one of those lunch things. Yep. Okay. The DNR does have funding available. Good ARPA, ARPA funds, I guess, that they're making available to utilities to test. Right, the governor kind of was talking yeah, yeah, yeah. about that. Yeah. And governor said, I think, that's big sometime. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Is there a question for Josh? All right. Policy discussion and recommendation item 10 and Crestwood Acre change order. Number four and five recommendation. Uh, point of order, Mr. Chairman. Yes. I will excuse myself for this item due to conflict of interest. All right. Go ahead, Michael. Sure. So uh, change order number four, um, kind of accounted for some uh, small variations in uh, project, or I guess variations in project quantities, as well as, um, you know, like a a 12 by 12 T being used instead of a 12 by 6 T, um, some of those things. But then uh, I guess the main item in there was the, there was a, a rock cutting and then a rock excavation. Um, the rock cutting was done on uh, Kirk Street, the existing sanitary sewers trench um, was in blasted rock and the existing pipe wasn't laid straight, it had a bend in it. So in order for the new trench to follow, um, the contractor had to go rent a big rock saw um, on their excavator and uh, cut the trench, which slowed them down uh, for a couple days. Um, so got the backup justification there for their cost. Then the rock excavation was primarily due to um, just some short sections of storm sewer and water main where the bedding material was on that blasted rock and they were able to scratch it off and be able to get good bedding material underneath it. So that, that one, the asking price was $114.21 a cubic yard. Uh, other projects we see it's usually, you know, rock excavations in the 120 to 150 range. So uh, that seemed okay, um, reasonable, I guess, in, in their ask. Uh, the overall cost with change order number four is an actual reduction or a decrease in the contract price of $31,050.28. And then uh, change order number five is, I guess, what we call a balancing change order, uh, where it, uh, you know, other kind of zeroing out quantities now that we have um, final um, quantities on the project. Uh, so again, then that decreases it an additional 17,181. So uh, between the two uh, change orders, there's a decrease in the contract price of uh, 48,231 uh, 66. What's your wish? I'll make a motion to uh, recommend the Village Board approved the change orders four and five as presented to reduce the overall contract price by $48,231.66. I'll second. Question? Uh, so what was the cost of cutting the rock total? Uh, the rock cutting uh, was just under 21 dollars It was 20894 and then the rock excavation was 5,880. So that's about 26,000. About 26,000. And the T's and 
Yeah, so, 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 so some of that was just substitution, like, uh, you know, so again, this 12 by 12 T wasn't in the original bidding document. Instead, we had a 12 by 6 T. Um, so, so a lot of those fittings were the same price. It was $1,000. It was just a matter of um, which ones were used, which ones weren't used. So we actually paying about twenty six dollars to $27,000 extra to the project. Then also we have a reduction of that total recovery. Correct, yeah. All right. Yeah, the net is that reduction. Right. Yep. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? I have it. Thank you. Item 11, Master Valve Heater Replacement. <clears throat> sure, our uh, utility operators came and just mentioned that the, the Metzger weld uh, furnace really needs to be replaced. When it kicks on, there's a, a physical feel of <laughs> kind of reverb through the whole building, and they've been kind of babysitting it for, well, I think it's original to the building since the 70s. So um, we got a couple proposals from PGA and Best One uh, to get uh, the actual furnace replaced and then some. Um, upgrades to the venting as well to, to meet some of the codes and improve the efficiency. So I think came in at about 8,500 on the PGA uh, proposal, the one that we'd be recommending to go with. Yeah, the best one was 10,685. So, what's your wish? Uh, move to, uh, or yeah, move to approve the proposal from PGA for 8,500. Second, okay. so second. Second. Discussion? How often is this causing problem? I mean, it's not that it doesn't heat. It's just that sometimes it actually blows itself out in the morning night, so then I'll try again, and then it'll just, if the doors are closed, you can actually hear the doors rattling when it kicks on. So it seems like an unsafe situation and should yeah. probably be taken care of. And... Okay. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? I have it, thank you. Item 12, the standard form of agreement for professional service discussion. Yeah. Uh, we had this last. We had this meeting. last time and then uh, Luis had asked for it to come back on. Um, I guess I'm not sure what I, I thought we had. The direction it seemed like was to um, utilize the form that attorney Yidi had gone through. So I guess I don't necessarily have anything further. I wasn't sure what. Luis's comments exactly were going to be. Um, I'll make one comment sure. just in reviewing it because I was I was going through one of Myron's contracts today and their umbrella liability stated request is five million and I think we've got it set in here at two million. Yeah. And I would I would ask that it be raised to five. Okay. Um you usually um uh, the environmental project goes up high, possibly. But but most of them I see now that the one, two days are gone and it's now, they want to see at least 5 million um, with the umbrella coverage. And so I, I looked at this scenario, I think we've got it at 2 million in the, yeah. End, yeah. In the ESA, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, usually in the standard of about 2 million. Uh, but as I said, for the environmental, we go to 5 million sometime, but, uh, I see five more. I see five a lot now. It's pretty, pretty common. Or well, usually contractors they have higher than the engineers because the engineers just do the design. Mm -hmm. The contractors do the construction. So just. Okay. I, I didn't know it was this used for construction. This would be for design services. Design. Yeah, okay. professional right. services. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you still want that five million aggregate? Then I'll back off that. I wasn't okay. I just yeah. happened to be reading contracts. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, the contractors definitely they have higher yeah. because they have more mm -hmm. liability in there. The engineers are I would say two million, but the uh, environmental five million possible. So. Okay. So we need approval on this? Yes, I think we should. Sure. I'll move to approve uh, the um, the uh, standard contracts for professional services as listed in the uh, as listed in the agenda packet. I'll second. Discussion. 
No discussion. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? I have it, but we didn't say which one we probably can use. Yeah. Um, one from, well, I guess this version was the one that um, Attorney Yidi has given us you know, the review and feedback on. Sure. So, yeah. yeah, I think that's the one we can go for. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. Feature item next meeting, Monday, March 14, 2022, at 4.30 p.m. Monday, April 12, 2022, at 4.30 p.m. Monday, May 10th, 2022, at 4.30 p.m. Monday, June 14, at 2022, 4.30 p.m. Item 14, topic for future meeting. Uh, just if the DNR has something on PFAS, if we could uh, just be informed of that, I'd appreciate it. Yep. I have a feeling it will be discussions at many future meetings. Yeah. Okay. Item 15, remarks from Administrator, Mr. Donner. Nothing unless you have questions. Question from Mr. Donner. Mm -hmm. Item 16, remarks from the staff. Yeah. Nothing. 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 No, I'm not quite talking about it. Well, you have to have a meeting. You can't yeah, I'm good. <laughs> All right. Remark from committee member. I just make a uh, quick remark. I, I thought it was very, very happy to see that you'd be proactive in issuing that uh, on Friday. Um, yeah. I read it, didn't comment back because I was out of town, but I, I was pleased to see that that uh, uh, you had put that together and, and put that information out for people. So I just want to commend the staff for that. But that was really well done. Josh did a great job putting his stuff uh, links on the website as well. I know there's a lot of stuff out there, so. It's easy to get lost in it all, I think. <laughs> yep, they showed on Channel 7, I think, night before. Mm -hmm. They were, I think they asked, they talked yeah, to Michael. They Fitz. called us. Yeah. So, no, it was good. <coughs> all right. Any announcement? 10 o'clock on the 16th, uh, U.S. women's hockey goes through the gold against Canada, mm -hmm. OUSA. Okay. I was frustrated watching the last game. That's all I got to tell you. Okay, I'll accept the motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Thank you very much.